Brent. This is about you too, Brent. Come on. Come on. Oh, good. They're still on speaking terms. That's awesome. How are you, sir? Doing well, thank you. Uh, the, the, the pleasure's mine. I was trying to figure out whose work I actually heard first, and then I started looking back through your CD, because of course we know Transformers, of course we know Futurama, we know Animaniacs, but up until a certain night in 77, the only impression I'd ever heard was Rich Little, until you were a guest on one of the Dean Martin celebrity roasts, and you ran through about a dozen impressions over the course of like three or four minutes, and uh, preteen me was just gobsmacked. <laughs> and I, I wanted to be a voiceover actor from that moment forward. So, gentlemen, thank you for spending this weekend with us, and thank you for sharing your talents with us through the decades. It's an absolute gas to have you. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, can I say, I think, on behalf of both Peter and myself, uh, we would like to start by just saying thank you all so much for standing in the lines, for waiting, for being such, such good fans and people. We really appreciate it. Thank you for loving us. Because we love you. 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 It's interesting because um, the... Oh, no, wait, no, I, I'm going to shut up. No, 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 no. <laughs> the, the story that I love about you, Frank, is that you didn't realize the fans' affection for Optimus Prime until Optimus passed away. And you're, the studio gave you all of these letters of support and love, and that was where it hit home for you at that point? <laughs> or is that, is that a fabrication because you can't believe anything on the internet? Well, I don't know. Um, I, I didn't like being put away. <laughs> and, and I think it was kind of a surprise because we were sitting, sitting in doing the reading because we'd get the scripts and uh, read through them before we would record. And Peter and I were sitting next to each other and Peter says to Frank, did you read that? I said, what? Oh, oh my God. I'm you... getting whacked. Yeah, I said those exact words. I said, what's going on here, huh? Yeah, yeah I'm whacked. <laughs> the end. Uh -huh. Page 17. <laughs> but I don't think the fans were too happy with that. And I think the studio and, um, and all, all the powers understood quickly and that uh, obviously you can't put Prem away anyway. So he came back and well deserved. Well, that was a very sad story. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't <laughs> Oh, well, I'm used to it. <laughs> When you work in as many animated titles as both of you have over the course of your careers, was there a character that you thought was going to be that lasting one for you, like Optimus wound up being for you? Because both of you, have, I mean, from, uh, from Scooby-Doo, from uh, the Sunny and Cher Hour, to all of the different voiceover um, work that you do, both animated and live action, was there a character that you said, okay, this is going to be the one. This is going to be the one where the toys are going to live, outlive me, where everything else is the case. Or, or was, tra was Transformers that first experience for both of you at that time? Well, let me just uh, say one thing first. Frank Welker is, is the king and probably the, the person that has done more <laughs> animation shows than anybody in the business. And uh, uh, that's why I call him the king, and he is the king. You are the king. Well deserved. Well deserved. Yeah. Yes, it is well deserved. And he always he says that, and it's, it's, it's not true, but it's very well appreciated. So one, day, in one day, in one day, he had 12 animated shows to go to wow. in his car. 
Show to show to show to show to show. Well, there was a period of time in animation, and, and I think we've both been lucky with timing, because when, when we started, animation actually just started to explode, and then it really exploded during our careers. And um, we were both young fellows at the time, and uh, my original casting was because I was young, and that was Scooby-Doo, which was my first show. It was. <laughs> it was, it was. And I did Fred, which was my own voice, which I thought would go away in two days. But uh, here we are 50 years later still doing that. But uh, Our first show together, oh. Mighty Man and Yuck. Yes. <laughs> yes. Did somebody remember that? Absolutely. Who was Mighty Man? Right, Peter. Who was Yuck? <laughs> Mighty, yes, yes. mighty, mighty, mighty man! No, you don't take off that dog! No, no, no! So ugly, I couldn't take the dog. <laughs> it's the stupidest show in the world. <laughs> and we've been friends ever since. Yeah. 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 Did the union have the four-hour rule in place when you were doing it? So, technically, you made a 44 hours worth of pay for a 24-hour day. Well, well, yeah, back in... Which the, is about uh, buck 85, I think. You'd yeah. buy a cup of coffee. Do the math. Yeah. <laughs> the, when we were doing, like, Transformers, uh, it was still an eight-hour day. And it was a full-on cast of fantastic actors and... and uh, uh, Wally Burr, the director, and I mean, we worked hard and had a lot of fun, obviously, you know, when you're a family working for eight hours together. But, like Peter and I and others, you start having all these other shows to do. In the middle of the show, uh, you go, <clears throat> all right, anybody have to leave? And two or three of us put up our hands. Of course, my <laughs> hand was always up to yeah. go somewhere and back and forth. And Peter would look at me. Again? Yeah. <laughs> but it was during, I think, that period of time where it switched to four hours, and that, that made it a lot easier on people. Because, you know, you can do a show, in our opinion, you can do a show in two, four hours or, or less if you have to. But, um, but not with Wally Burr. <laughs> yeah, Wally, he, Wally Burr, and they, the, that's the reason they, the shows were so good, is because Wally took his time and... Uh, when we did layers of sound, uh, he would have four or five layers. Yeah. And so you would, you know, you were a soldier, you had to grunt or you had to shoot a, a gun or you had to get wounded or you had to scream, you know, and, and attack. So you would do that and that would be level number one. Thank you. All right, now we're gonna do level number two. <laughs> so remember now, you. Don't use the same voice, all right? <laughs> Rolling. Okay, half an hour. So now we're going to do level number three. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Right, now we're going to do level number four. Oh, yeah. no. Excuse me, Wally. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got a recording at five o'clock this afternoon. I, I don't think I should be doing it. <laughs> All right, well, Peter, you can go. <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> All right, throw them up. Who's got it first? Right here. With the reboot of Animaniacs and uh, the new Aladdin movie coming out, will you be reprising any of your roles? I'm glad to say yes. In, uh, in Animaniacs, I'm very, very happy to be playing Ralph the Gaut. That's D A G A R T. Ralph the Gaut. And none of those little Animaniacs are going to get in the studio without getting past me. <laughs> Uh, 
I was very excited. I thought I was going to be the studio uh, chief, which I was before. Huh? Was Mr. Plotz, Mr. Plotz. head of the studio? I'm Mr. Plotz. I've been replaced by a woman. So there's fairness in animation, see? So uh, Ralph the Guard is going to cause trouble. And then in uh, Aladdin, which is coming out, uh, I will be doing The Cave of Wonders. I'm amazed that Disney lawyers allowed you to even say that. Uh, back there, black shirt. Uh, that doesn't narrow it down much, sorry. Yeah, this question's for Frank. Um, for Soundwave, did you have to use a different mic for that voice? Uh, Soundwave, what I did was basically that very similar voice, which is based on Barry White. Yeah. Because I love Barry White so much, and he was just so cool, you know. Just like, So, uh, for Soundwave, these are secrets. So, for Soundwave, it was just talking monotone. My leech. Well, that it wasn't almost monotone. But... My leech, I report. Oh, duty. We have Autobots in the vicinity. I report. And then Scott Browning, who was our, our uh, engineer at the time, used, I think it was called a vocoder or some electronic yeah, modulation modulator and took that voice and moved it up and down and all around so I go me -ne 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 but I just thought as very white <laughs> I'm pretty sure I just got pregnant right there <laughs> My lawyer will be in touch. <laughs> uh, during cast recordings, do you have any fond memories or stories with Chris Lotta who did like on G.I. Joe or, uh, you know, Joe Commander or, or Starscream on Transformers? I don't, I don't know if you sat with him and actually recorded with him at the same time, if it was full cast or if you did individual, but if you have any stories, that might be. Chris Lotta, a very intense performer, and my memories of of Chris, who passed away several years ago. One of the most uh, vivid memories I have of Chris is when he was playing Starscream. Yeah. He had, he had a, a, a particular episode where he was uh, saying a lot of words, and it was always intense. And Chris would have beads of sweat, literally, his hair would be soaking wet, the sweat would be rolling off his face, dripping on his shirt, his underarms would be soaking wet. That's how much he put into his character. He was, you'd sit there, and I would just, no, no. Holy shit. <laughs> guy's gonna have a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, and he was a big guy. And so everything he did, as Peter said, was so intense. And even sometimes, like, if you worked next to him, you wanted to have a little piece of cellophane. <laughs> there was a lot of... <laughs> we loved Chris, so he was amazing. What a time. Right here in the chief seats. My question is for uh, Frank and Peter. I would like to know if uh, if you guys enjoy yourself of re uh, repricing uh, the roles of Megatron Optimus Prime on the latest movie of Transformers: The Last Night. Well, do we like doing it? Yeah, I'm um, saying. Love it. Put your camera down. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. We have more fun working together, no matter what characters they are. You know, Megatron and and uh, Optimus Prime can be going at it on the script, and then. You know, a millisecond later, we're laughing our butts off. You know, just <laughs> how you can get a serious performance out of us is uh, well, that's their problem. <laughs> Remember too, when we uh, when we did this this last feature, of course, I obviously loved it because I came from Galvatron back into Megatron, 
And even though these are the newer versions, there was a G1, obviously, but it had transformed. And so now it was Galvatron, and then Galvatron ran into Megatron again. So that was enjoyable. It clears out a lot of stuff. <laughs> But Peter and I were in the studio actually together and we were doing, I guess, promos for it or something. Oh, no, no, we, you were just finishing and I was coming in and Michael Bay said, hey, why don't we get the guys together and uh, we'll, we'll film a couple of promos. You guys want to do some stuff? So we were in there together. And we were talking about it. We're doing it. And he, cut! Get out, get out, get out, get out. He made us leave. We were having too much fun, remember? <laughs> singing and doing a song, and he's going, guys, cut, get out. It's Hollywood, you never know, there's somebody there who could discover you. Yeah. <laughs> be on your toes. <laughs> Go ahead, what's your question, young man? Me? You? <laughs> me? I just asked my question. A great honor to finally meet such living legend of the voice acting industry, and I'd like to know, what would you say your personal favorite like, Transformers film to do? Your favorite Transformer property, either uh, film or episode to do. If there was one that stands out from the 18 million episodes you guys have. <laughs> <laughs> mm. No, I, nothing really stands out as being a, it, they were all, you know, fun to do. And, uh, I can't remember anything crazy going on in the studios back in those days, but we used to all work together. And uh, there'd be 10 microphones lined up in a row facing the, uh, the glass panel with the director on the other side and whoever, writers or whoever else was there. And um, it, it was always fun. You know, I, somebody said once, if you do something in your life that you love, you'll never work a day the rest of your life, you know? And here we are, maybe 10 guys, all in a row, and some of us, you know, having more fun than we should, but <laughs> just like we are here. And um, uh, every one of us, you know, just, just enjoying what we did, and uh, the camaraderie, and uh, the, uh, the sense of feeling in the room was always very profound. We cared, you know, and uh, sometimes we were overawed by the performances of individuals, you know, and we just go, wow, where did that come from? You know, we'd have those moments as well. And with this guy, it was constant. Constant. We have sometimes uh, guests. Constant. <laughs> I wouldn't say. Well, constant is a good word. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to tell you, it was constant. Oh, it wasn't even a lot, Chief. Oh, Lord, Chief. Yes, I dreamed I was in the Miss America contest. Oh, Chief. Who was it, Break Park? Well, they're all running around in our minds. <laughs> and they're loose. <laughs> I get so oh man. There was even in our in our voice recordings yesterday. Uh, where's the gentleman from New Zealand? Is he here? Oh, there you are. And he actually brought his phone for a reference for me because I had some really old Transformers and Autobots that, that, that you know I actually I hadn't heard. And I said, oh, I'm not really sure on Trailmark. He says, I've got these four numbers. Hey, don't get right. <laughs> right? Stand up all the way from New Zealand. <laughs> what a great family. <laughs> you guys are great. Uh, back there in the orange, yes. Did 
you guys enjoy David Kay and Corey Bennett's performances? Next. <laughs> They're lovely performers. I'll let you handle that one. <laughs> oh, I'll let you handle that one. <laughs> they can be a handful. Um, no, I'm kidding. They're, they're both wonderful performances. But it, it's, it's, it's a matter of scheduling at some points, and also they're doing that in Vancouver like every other piece of um, performance at this point. So I'm, I'm going to take that bullet for you. Uh, <laughs> happily, happily. Uh, right here, yes. Um, well, we're coming up on the anniversary of the uh, passing. Do you have any, uh, any memories of working with uh, Casey Kasem? The question was about Casey Kasem on the anniversary of his uh, lateness. Yeah, Casey obviously left us way, way too early. Um, I met Casey so many years ago, and we were very good friends. I think I may have met Casey even before Peter. And uh, uh, he was a young man, as I was in those days. <laughs> and uh, he was very, very friendly, outgoing. Uh, he was uh, into radio, not quite as heavy as he got to be even, but he was already in radio. And he um, kind of took me under his wing, you know, since like Scooby was my first show and we actually were auditioning for uh, the parts that we wanted. He wanted actually to do Freddie and I wanted to do Shaggy. And so we had discussions about that. It was really interesting. You know, he was pulling for me, and I was pulling for him. When we got the job together, I mean, and he was, you know, basically a pretty big star already. And I was just, you know, kicking on the block, making noises and parking cars incorrectly. <laughs> Sorry, I, yeah, I thought you had a Volkswagen. Oh, your Volvo. Okay, I'll bring it. I parked cars at parties. <clears throat> but anyhow, he, uh, out of the radio days, so he, he taught me a lot about radio, and uh, he um, was one of the few guys who would always recommend me for work. Once he got to know me, and the, we do in the voice business, recommend each other, but early on, Casey was always recommending me for jobs, and I'd say, how did you know? And they said, oh, Casey Casey give you a name, you know? So he was very, very good in that respect, and uh, we miss him, he's a good guy. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, blue shirt. That's the incredible thing about this man. Not only in a lot of things, but well, there's many, many incredible things. Many, many incredible things. But that's his voice. I mean, when he does Optimus Prime, it's Optimus Prime. And he doesn't get any help. <laughs> you have to use your imagination, well, no. obviously. Level five! No! Level five. <laughs> Autobots, transform and roll out! So good. Who needs modulation? <laughs> At some point, do the lines like that wind up being like if you're playing, if you're a member of Leonard Skinner, there's somebody yelling Freebird up on the front row? Does it wind up being that for you, or do you still feel it? That I don't know. I, I don't know how to answer that, because there, there's so many lines that are iconic on their own, you know, and uh, they mean something. But over, over time, they take on a life of their own. And uh, they mean so much to, to Thank you people. For 
One shall stand, one shall fall. Some of those lines you can say, you know, in, to somebody one-on-one, uh, -on -one, and uh, like, you'll apply that line to something in particular that maybe you were talking about, or might have some very sincere moment that has to be addressed, and you can, it'll, the line will come to my mind, and I'll just say, knowing that they're a fan, I'll say, for example, you know, friendship or something, and just say, to all are one, you know, and they'll go, I get you, I get you. <laughs> I understand, yeah, yeah. That's a fun thing about some of those lines. And you have a bunch of them, too. Well, I'm saying that you yeah. have a bunch of them. I, you How know. do I know? <laughs> <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. I have no more words. <laughs> I will just say, Mr. Optimus Prime. Yes? Why throw your life away so recklessly? <laughs> you and those fleshlings, those humanoids, what is it with you and your heart? <laughs> Megatron, you have never been right. <laughs> Even when we were kids. <laughs> Your toys were always better than mine. <laughs> I remember that one that was a little better than mine. I had to blow it up. <laughs> that wasn't the only toy you blew up. <laughs> you and the Trump are evil. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> wondering for decades now, Mr. Welker, when you got the script for Mars Attacks and you saw that every line was ack ack yeah. like, did you go, I've made it. I, 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 I said, yeah, this is written for me. <laughs> that kind of dialogue. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a very interesting thing. And then trying to, to make sense out of that was was crazy. Yeah. You made it work. Yeah, thank you. It was awesome. Uh, yeah, right here. No, I'm sorry. Here uh, first, thank you. Yes. So, again, I'm sure if I speak for everyone, thank you guys for being with us this weekend. Thank you. And um, I had a chance to speak to you a little bit yesterday, but if you had any advice for someone wanting to get into a vocal um, recording, what would you tell them and who would you study and like, what type of vocal exercises or programs to get into? The question is, if you want to break into the voice acting industry, what advice would you give somebody who's getting ready to start out? Well, the first thing, and, and something that I missed early in my career, because I spent too much time being a juvenile delinquent, but <laughs> is, is to read. To read, read, read. I mean, just read as much as you can get your hands on. And that's literature or anything. And then, for as far as working, then you can read commercials, you can read the news, but just read and understanding words so that you have the freedom when you get the script to just see it and read it. Because you'll get a lot of work by being able to act and read and decipher what's on that page quickly. Because there's some people that were really good actors but had trouble reading and so when you read and you're stumbling and having problems, then the people in the booth think, well, psh, you can't act, boom, you know? So that's one thing, it's important, it's good for your, your brain anyway. Read, read, read. Practice, make noises, act silly, never limit yourself. Be realistic though, know what, know thyself. Who said that, Socrates? No, no. He said I drank what? Yeah. <laughs> but know, know you, yourself. But don't limit yourself. Frankie uh, Galati said. Yeah, yeah. Frankie, yeah. Frankie said that. Yeah, Frankie Galati. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Awesome, thanks. So, do you have any uh, funny stories from ad libbing going off script to throw off maybe the other person or anything like that? They don't have any funny stories whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Not one. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, my job in life is to try and make him laugh. And break him up, especially when he's in his serious scene. So the answer is yes, and it usually was a fly. We'd be doing like, the, the director is talking to you, like Wally. Wally was so, uh, such a good director, he was so intense. And he would read every line with you. So I mean, I'm surprised he wasn't just dead tired at the end of the day, because he did everybody's line. But he would give you so much information that we could eat lunch and talk, you know, and he would be down looking at the script. So I would be irritating Peter now. <laughs> And then I'd have him going, and so then when he click on the line, oh, I step by to roll out. I do all these really groovy things. <laughs> I look over at Peter and I just go like this, and as soon as he saw my hand up there, he'd start laughing. That didn't make any noise at all. And so Wally would look up, what is it, Peter? <laughs> Come on, we've only got eight hours. Hey. He would make me laugh, especially after I'd taken a drink of water in the hopes that it would come out my nose, my eyes, and my ears. It's better with milk. <laughs> oh, boy. You had to be there. And that's why Transformers cost $250 million to make. Uh, sorry. Uh, red shirt and the black cat. Uh, I just one question was for both of y'all. Thank you uh, for the war for Cybertron line. I play that game like almost every day. <laughs> uh, have either of y'all been approached for the new War for Cybertron series that's going to start off on Netflix? Can you say anything about that? The question's about the upcoming Netflix series, because there's 19,000 of them apparently. War for Cybertron? I don't know. I, I don't. I'm, I'm glad you show. brought that up. Say again? <laughs> How do you spell Cybertron? <laughs> Check and do it. Thank Tell you. Me your favorite Wally Burr moment. Your favorite story with Wally. Favorite story about Wally Burr. I think that was pretty much the ones where I, I could irritate. I mean, Wally would have no idea what we were doing in the in the studio. I said he he was so into his scripts, and he literally. I mean, if you looked at his scripts, there was notes and drawings, and he studied them. And then when he performed them, which he would do, I mean, every line for every character. And you know how difficult that is? I mean, it takes so much energy. And so he'd be reading for Optimus Prime, you know. I remember Level two. Level three. I mean, he was really, really into it. So the fun thing, I can still remember, is Wally, and you just see the top of his head. Because he was writing and working and stuff. And Peter's doing his thing, and then if I got him to go, you just see this. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, what is it? You know, we... <laughs> so I would say just getting him in trouble, and then Wallen knew by the end of the day that, you know, he knew who was causing the trouble. <laughs> yes? We have one more question. I'm going to go as far back in the room as possible. Oh. No, I'm not. I'm kidding. Oh. Right here. I was curious. Uh, how did you guys get inspiration for the voices of Optimus Prime and Megatron? Because they're so distinct. Obviously, Optimus has a lower sounding voice, but there's also lots of um, inflection in every word that he says versus Megatron, which there's a, more of a flamboyance to it. Was that something that Wally worked with the two of you on, or did you guys come up with that sound yourself? The question is the inspiration for developing the distinct character voices for Optimus and Megatron. Well, I'm going to go first because his, his story is, is, is very, very, very cool and important to hear. My, my side of it was that, uh, again, Wally at this period of time was doing like 10 different shows. He was so busy. And so there was all of these characters in Transformers. And when we got to call the audition, there was just a table full of, of drawings. And of course, with my ego, I picked every single drawing that I could to read, you know, and it's, a, it's numbers. You figure if you try, you get them. I didn't have back to Megatron. And I just looked at the picture and I was thinking of this voice and uh, I thought it was metallic and evil and what could I do? And 
I just it, that's what came. And I was so happy because sometimes when you go in with a voice to the, the studio or whoever decides what the final voices are going to be, Hasbro or Marvel Comics, whoever, they listen to it and they come back and say, you know, we like this, but we want you to make it a little more like that or do it like this. <clears throat> and it's okay, but it takes it away from your basic DNA and your instincts. Megatron, they didn't touch. And I think it was because Wally was so busy uh, because they would have probably asked Wally, well, you know, maybe you could add some thoughts in here because, I mean, he, he could help design things. But they were so busy, everything stayed, and I got Megatron and a few other characters. And that was my experience. So I was so pleased because that was my basic instinct, and, and that's what came just out of looking at the picture. Megatron, leader of the Decepticons. <laughs> Um, well, mine is, is poignant uh, in another direction, in a sense, because uh, my brother Larry was my mentor and my inspiration, and uh, he was Optimus Prime, as far as I was concerned. And it was on the day that I auditioned for the role, um, <clears throat> I was on my way to, to the voice caster, and um, he asked me where I was going. And we were sharing an apartment at the time in Burbank, California, <laughs> I said, Peter, where are you going? He said, I, uh, Larry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go audition for, uh, at, uh, as a truck. He's <laughs> 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 a truck, yeah. Well, no, Larry, uh, but the truck is a hero truck. I mean, he's, uh, he's a big semi-truck and he's supposed to be a hero. And he looked at me and said, because this is my brother Larry, taller by six inches, 13 months older, former captain in the Marine Corps, fought in Vietnam, Bronze Star with V cluster, a couple of Purple Hearts thrown in for heavy wounds. And he says, Peter, if you're going to be a hero, be a real hero. Don't go yelling and screaming like a Hollywood phony, <laughs> pretending you're a tough guy. Be strong enough to be gentle. Don't be a you know what I mean. <laughs> so just be real. Have compassion and, sh and strength. And don't yell. He said, okay, Lauren. I got to the audition. I looked at the uh, picture. And there was a, a truck. And there was the transformation of this <coughs> hero. And so I got inside and I had the page in front of me and it says, my name is Optimus Prime. I should have been able to say, my name is Larry Cullen. <laughs> you know, and it just came out. And that's what I did. Performances you've given us, and I look forward to the next eight decades of them because you're never, you're not allowed to go anywhere either. But you have to get on a plane. Thank you, Peter, ladies and gentlemen.